Well, now, did someone pay him, or did he have take a free will offering? Could have a free will offering as all. Well. Yeah. yeah. Huh. No, he used to stay at the folks a lot of times. Now, what about Fred Schaefer? He did a lot of preaching at the schoolhouse, didn't he? Yeah, at the consolidated school. Okay. He was pretty good, wasn't well, he? He was or? good, yeah. He used to use the uh, phonograph? Phonograph uh, for his pulpit. One time he got so excited, he was pounding on the phonograph and started rolling down the aisle a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Got their attention then. Yeah. <laughs> no, he was a good, good fellow. He was the first cottage on Webb Lake. Fred Schaefer. Yeah. Okay. Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Yeah. He and Jesse Pilgrim. I mean, yeah. she was kind of a live-in maid, I guess, she was wasn't maid, she? Yeah. And then Fred's wife was Esther. Esther? Was it Esther? I guess it was Esther, yeah. Fred, no, was Fred, it? Jesse. Fred Jesse. 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 He'd say, he'd stop at the house and watch Mom bathe Marlis, you know? Yeah. And then when the mail would come, he'd holler, Jess, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Wellen walked to the lumber camps to minister to the men working there. Once when he ran out of funds, he said, he prayed to God for help so he could make his rounds again to the logging camp. Soon thereafter, he said a gust of wind blew a $10 bill right into his hand. He looked around the corner for the owner of the bill, but no one was there. God had answered his prayer. Fred Schaefer and family were summer residents on Webb Lake and personal friends of the Billy Sundays. Mr. Schaefer taught the Bible class at Sunday school and often became emotional during his preaching. <laughs> Once he pulled a jackknife from his pocket and cut a button off his coat. Mrs. Sunday was a visitor at the Schaefer home one Sunday. She used her talent to preach at Webster and was successful in getting people to come to the front and accept the Lord as their Savior. Mm -hmm. uh, Billy Sunday preached here too then? Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember that, hearing him? Was uh, that your dad's Duluth time? Duluth Superior to hear him, or Duluth rather. Okay. A bunch of us went up there with an old Model T. The Rock had a Model T truck, kind of a cattle truck like, and we all got in that. It must have been about 10, 15 of us went up. Do you remember who some of those people were? Or are you saying family or yeah, community? Yeah, Marshes. Uh, and uh, Harleys. Esther and Ruth and Grant. A lot of them went up. Did he give a hellfire and brimstone message? Is yeah, that yeah. Was he a good speaker? He, well, he came up out of the, he rose up a door, you know. He'd pop up out of there and get up on the... Oh, really? Yeah. On the stage, you yeah. mean? Okay. Heard he threw chairs around and things? No. no. That's the only antics he did? Yeah. But the only come right out of that hole there, just like a wildcat. It, was that his entrance onto the podium, you mean? Yeah. Okay. What was the purpose of that? Get your attention? Just get the attention, I suppose. Did he? What kind of speaking manner, style did he have? Well, he brimstone and fire. Okay, shouted to and you better, yeah. better accept or yeah. else. <clears throat> Archibald Mullenix was a civil... Mm -hmm. What is it? Mm -hmm. Mullenix. Mullenix was a Civil War veteran, and after his death, he was laid to rest in the Webb Lake Cemetery. He died October 7, 1916. John Spafford was a Civil War veteran, enlisting at age 14. Floyd March served in the Spanish-American War in 1898. Young men serving in World War I were Paul Thatcher, Grant Johnson, Chester, and Ralph March. Grant Johnson died of the flu in camp, and his remains were shipped home. The government placed a large engraved marker on the gravesite in the Webb Lake Cemetery. The early settlers gathered at various places in the town on Sundays and some holidays for a picnic. Some brought homemade ice cream, others brought cake and other goodies. One such gathering was on the lake and place near Lake Des Moines Lake. Other picnics were held at the Webb Creek Indian Mounds and near Webb Lake. The men and folks played ball in the field near the picnic grounds near Des Moines Lake and met with other towns' ball teams to play, mostly on Sundays. 
-hmm. Now, the Webb Creek or the Webb Lake Indian Mounds, would that be like on the north end of Lower Webb? Yeah. Okay. And what did you say used to happen by that big white pine tree down here in Bear Lake, isn't Well, a lot of people would come there to water their horses there, picking blueberries, you know. Be a lot of people parked around there. What's that? And that uh, baseball, that was right there, the old Webb Lake Schoolhouse. There was a big field there, they used to play ball there. Now, I think you said you and Ivan used to go down by Christner's Corner and Scott down there and yeah. played ball there. No, we didn't play ball. We went down there to watch them. Okay. From the farm, we walked down there and watched them play ball and come back and we'd pick up the cows on the way home. <laughs> okay. The early settlers gathered at various places in the town on Sundays and some holidays for a picnic. Some brought, did I read that? Keep reading even if you did. Some brought homemade ice cream, others brought cake and other goodies. One such gathering was on the Larkin Place in Des Moines Lake, others were held at Pick Web Creek, Indian Mounds, and near Web Lake. Yeah, I did read that. The men, I read that too. Entertainment for the young folks included an evening with Mrs. Henry, Laura Greenwood's home. She played in her organ and they sang songs and played games. What? What's that about? That's right up the uh, Greenwood place right up oh, here. Oh, yeah, that 40? Yeah. No, no, that's Hardy Place. Okay. This is right there, north here. And who is she? She was she was a Greenwood. She was a Harley, Mabel Harley, or Laura Harley. And she married a Greenwood, and then they homesteaded that place right up there, 40 acres. Was, was she musically inclined and in that? Oh, no, this home. They learned it by themselves. Okay. During the fall months, families gathered wild cranberries for food, and some were used to decorate the Christmas trees using long strings of cranberries and popcorn. Mm -hmm. Hunting was good at Webb Lake. Rabbits, deer, bear, partridge, pintail, grouse, woodcocks, ducks, other game were hunted for food, and trappers would catch a beaver, muskrats, ermine, and few otter. Their pelts are sold to buyers at Spooner or a nearby store. You know, the prairie chicken I'd seen over on the farm, it'd be 15 to 50 prairie chickens right around the farm there. And the old stumps from the Hinkley fire, there'd be just oh, dozens of them on, an old, on a limb, you know. Huh. They just disappeared. There were many there were more stores or trading posts in the town following the closing of the McDowell store on Lily Lake. Well, Weldon, Webb, and Charles March sold groceries, and Charles March became the second postmaster here. His store was built on part of the Rolla Marsh property. He later sold to Carl and Emil Johnson, and Emil's wife, Alice, became third postmaster of Webb Lake. The Johnsons moved the store on log rollers to its present site. It's now owned by the Troy Main family. You didn't say that, that uh, Emil sold it to Ivan and I, and I sold it to Ivan, and Ivan sold it to Maine. Oh, they left that out, huh? Mm. So the store was sold to Carl and Emil, and Emil's, or Carl and Emil, and then they and sold... We bought, and we bought it from Emil. You and Ivan. Ivan. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I sold it to Ivan, and Ivan sold it to Maine. Okay. Now, it said the store was moved on rollers, and it, it was what, half a mile about a quarter west? Of, about a quarter of a mile east of what, where it is now. Okay. Now, oh, is that the main store? Yeah, that's the main store. Yeah. So that was what was on rollers here? Yeah, it was moved down on rollers. After a few... A few years, Carl and wife Helen sold their portion of the store to Emil and family. They served the community for quite some time and then decided to sell and try their luck at grocery in Markville with a relative, Ray Chipman. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yes. Went to Markville, huh? Oh, here we go. Here it's oh. in here. Ivan and Guy Johnson purchased the store from Emil and Alice Johnson, and Ivan Johnson became the postmaster at the time. The Johnson boys added hardware feed and flour, tires, clothing to the store, and bought cream from farmers and tested it on equipment furnished by Duluth Creamery. They did well for the first year, then Guy decided to try 
contracting to build houses in Minneapolis. Ivan had married by then, and he and his wife continued in the store business. Any travelers or others being in the store at the mealtime were always invited in to eat with them. One such drop-in was a Chicago baseball pitcher and sports writer named Gus Munch. He spent several days fishing on the Webb Lake using one of Will Marsh's boats and fell in love with fishing in the wilderness he found here. On leaving, he asked the Johnsons to build a few cottages and he'd write an article in one of the sports magazines and would guarantee to keep them filled with fishermen. Johnsons thought resort business just a dream then, didn't do much about it until the following article brought some quick changes not only for the Ivan Johnsons but the whole town's way of life. Webb Lake, Wisconsin, tucked away among the hills up the northwestern part of the state, is a variable paradise for the bass fishermen looking for virgin waters as yet, but little fished and less known. It's about 25 miles northwest from Spooner on the CNNW Railroad and 15 miles northeast from Danbury on the Sioux Line in a section of the state as yet unfarmed and very sparsely settled. There are no good highways leading to the lake, nothing but winding sand roads that prohibit anything but small light cars. But after you get there, man... What? Bass fishing. Webb Lake has about 25 to 30 miles of wonderful bass shoreline, lily pad coves, bays, big reed beds, stumps, and everything that the big mouth bass love. Five pound bass is common. Six and seven pounders are taken occasionally. Good sized northern pike are also frequently caught, but no muskies. There isn't a house on the whole lake and only three old leaky flat bottom boats <laughs> down in one end that a nearby farmer rents out. That's the only farm on the whole lake, too, that not another building near it anywhere. There are no accommodations, no resorts of any kind, but there is a wonderful location for a fisherman's resort at the bridge between the two parts of the lake. This is a good tip for some inter enterprising resort builder who wants to establish a real fisherman's resort out in the wilderness. It is a beautiful country, high hills covered with hard woods and evergreens and some real brook trout streams with trout in them winding their way among the hills from one lake to another, for there are numerous other fine fishing lakes close at hand all as wild and unsettled as Webb Lake, but none so large. I saw one bass taken out of Webb Lake, weighing seven and a half pounds and seven more, seven pounds in weight. Deer, bear, partridge, and chicken are plentiful, but no duck.